What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Sand Hill Road. I'm your host, Erasmus Elsner, and I'm here today with Gen Isayama. Gen Isayama is the general partner and CEO of Weld Innovation Labs. Weld Innovation Labs, it's a incubator, it's a venture capital firm. It is a platform to educate entrepreneurship and to facilitate open innovation between startups and large corporations in Japan. It is based in Palo Alto and Tokyo. It has just recently announced a $1 billion fund, which is split across World Innovation Labs 3, the third flagship fund, a strategic partnerships fund, and a corporate innovation fund. Again, very happy to have you here today with us. Where does this podcast find you today? No, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to have an opportunity like this. I just came back from Japan a day ago, and I'm still a little bit jet lagged, but I'm very excited to share about my journey and how we are different from the traditional VCs and how mm -hmm. we want to you know, deliver a value to our society and do good to our community. And for the audience, just a, a bit of a high level background. I mentioned Weld Innovation Labs based in Palo Alto and Tokyo. You have a large team. You've grown it as a platform. It is a platform that will educate entrepreneurship, which is sort of your long-term vision and, and mission. Maybe just give us the two-minute pitch on, on what Wealth Innovation Labs is all about, how you came to found it. Yes. You know, after I spent a decade at a very traditional Santa Road venture capital firm, obviously I wouldn't join venture capital without passion and entrepreneurship, how average people can change the world. And when I started my own firm, World Innovation Lab, my mission was clearly to give entrepreneurship to everyone's hand. And what I mean by that is that one is obviously, you know, we do venture capital investments in US, Europe, and Japan. And those are already people or, who already have and embrace entrepreneurship. But we also do, as you mentioned, corporate spin outs and also incubation based on what the society is looking for. And, and those are also important because those are kind of people who want to try new things. Those could be people that are working in big companies or in the government or could be in the public sector, yet just don't know how to start. So those are people we want to give them entrepreneurship and help them achieve their dreams. And even for people who had no idea what they want to do, I think everyone can become an entrepreneur in the world we live in. So we educate and, and it could be doctors who work in a hospital or it could be a you know, government officials who want to change the way they do things. Or it could be a school teacher who was frustrated because the education system hasn't changed much. So my mission was, how can I empower these people, not just startup founders, which all the venture capitalists and all the accelerators of the world is already helping. I wanted to extend my help beyond those traditional entrepreneurship worlds such that, you know, eventually those people who become entrepreneurs, we can invest in those people. And I wanted to embrace diversity in the society, not just entrepreneurs with the tech skills. It could be people around us who want to change the way they do things. So that's our mission. Obviously, venture capital investment is a big part of our business activity. But like you said, we do corporate spin outs, we do incubation. And we also provide entrepreneurship education to empower people so that they can, they can one day become a startup founder. Yeah, that's really exciting. And if I look into your background, you studied the least entrepreneurial thing in the world, studying law. And from law, you then transitioned and your way into Silicon Valley was by doing an MBA at Stanford, basically spending some time in the Bay Area. Talk about how it was for you the first couple of years coming from the Japanese culture, seeing the American entrepreneurial spirit and sort of how that changed your mindset. Yes, I came to you know Silicon Valley in, in 2001 with my family to go to business school. But prior to that, I was working in Japan in a very large commercial bank. And obviously I was helping corporates and, and, and to some extent, a little bit of venture. A lot of the things that my bank used to do is help these emerging companies become large companies eventually. And I, as a hobby, used to do a lot of programming when I was small. So even though I went to law school and business school, technology was always close to me. I used to build my computer myself. I fell in love with IT technology. And, and when I saw a lot of students at Stanford across the ocean doing so-called startup, I was very envious. I was a college student during mid-90s. So I really wanted to figure out a way to 
go there and really experience what entrepreneurship at Silicon Valley looks like. So in 2001, after I worked for a couple of years at my bank, I had an opportunity to be company sponsored to study overseas. And I picked Stanford for all the reasons. And, and my mission was to learn about entrepreneurship. And like, it's, like you mentioned, when I came to Silicon Valley in 2001, it was after the dot-com bubble burst in 99, 2000. So and in one sense, there were so many case studies how these IT startups failed. But the other half was, you know, people were not too interested about startup anymore. You know, startup and venture capital was, not, uh, was kind of not a very popular place to work for, for a lot of the business school grad at that time. So people would go to consulting or investment banking or big companies. But, you know, I really wanted to study about the startup ecosystem. So I continued my journey to you know, expose myself in the startup world, you know, stalking my friends who said they're going to start their own company to talking to alumni who was running unknown startups. I'd say two year of case study was good, but after that, I decided to stay and by being in the venture world directly, I came to realize how, how powerful these ecosystem was to, you know, to create something new from, from scratch. And I saw people who've done something that I would never have believed on on the original pitch, but, you know, after their persistence and tenacity, they, they made it happen. And some of my classmates became very well-known entrepreneurs and some of the alumni of Stanford obviously started a big company. So that really impacted how I view myself and what I wanted to do in my life. And it was very different from where I came from. And Japan, where I came from, was still operating under so-called closed innovation, where every big companies would run their own innovation internally. And it's very slow because it's very consensus-based decision-making process and everyone has to agree. And, and obviously you're only getting the advices and know-how of your internal employees. Whereas in U.S., it, it be, things are becoming more and more open. You know, we were embracing so-called Web 2.0 where a lot of the enterprise activity was going on cloud, more efficient, more open source. And even individuals were going to SNS, blog, YouTubes, where each individual were empowered to express themselves. And in Japan, like I said, the corporates were very slow, very close. And even individuals, because they were always working in those, those close environment, they, they still had to follow harmony and consensus-based culture. So no one was, you know, trying to express themselves. So... I felt that the world in Japan is diverging from what's happening in Silicon Valley and the gap was widening. And that's kind of when I felt I need to do something to the country that I grew up. And I just felt like Japan has so much more, so many talented people, so much technologies and wealth created, yet not doing enough in, in the modern world that I experienced in Silicon Valley. So that was kind of a big impact in my life. You know, I was having a great experience in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. yet my country where I came from was kind of lagging and I wanted to do something. So it, it was, it was, a, you know, it was like my life determining experience to stay here and to witness what happened in the Valley. Gotcha. And you have a first row seat to a, a top venture firm, DCM. I had Kylie Lu on the show who was a partner yeah. at DCM. Two years ago, and I mean, they had so many breakout successes recently with Kai Shu. They were actually the first firm to invest both in, in the US and Asia and really playing this, this intersection of sometimes, you know, tech trends emerging in the US coming to Asia. And then more recently, very frequently, actually the trends emerging in Asia and then coming to the US, right? And you had really first row exposure to this firm, how they're building this and fostering this innovation and collaboration between the, the two regions and continents. Talk a little bit about sort of how that shaped your perspective on the potential of, of the collaboration, the open innovation between the continents and the different cultures. Yes. So after I graduated in a business school, I, you know, I was looking for a job to learn about entrepreneurship ecosystem. And one of which was DCN. You know, there are a lot of Stanford alumni in the firm. 
and I got to know the founders and they said, Hey, we're, we're thinking of expanding into Asia, which at that time, no one was really taking it seriously, but you know, given my background growing up in Asia, I thought I could offer some help. And so that's how I joined an associate. I think there are three things I learned at DCM. One is obviously I joined as associate, I became a partner after a few years, but during that process, obviously learning the skills of venture capital from fundraising to sourcing deals, to running due diligence. And once you, once you invest, you have to help them, you do the biz dev, and obviously you have to exit, you have to harvest those investment. The whole cycle of being a venture capital, you know, it, it did take 10 years. It, it, you cannot do all that in three years. So I was fortunate enough to, to experience few cycle of fundraising and harvesting during that 10 years. And that really gave me the skills and know-how of what I need to do to be a good venture capitalist and to source good deals. And second part, like you said, I was hired to explore their international strategy. And the first area was Asia. And at that time, maybe a little bit after I joined in 2003, few myself and there were a few agents hired at that point. And our task was to figure out how we do Asia. And the first office we opened was in China in Beijing. And after that, the world called BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China became a, those emerging market became a very hot places for venture capitalists to invest. First hand experience what happened in China. You know, when I went to China in 2003, the, th the infrastructure was very poor and I just didn't see any much sign of entrepreneurship. But we all know after a decade, China became one of the largest venture capital market. All the hungry Chinese entrepreneur became a very well-known entrepreneur chains, how the IT world shaped. And you know, I was just just fascinating how such big change could happen in such a short period. And, and finally, like you said, I also realized that everything is, there's no border. That everything happens globally now. It's not just Silicon Valley thing. I saw something happened in China. And after helping, you know, China office launch, I went to my home country, Japan, to open DCM Japan and saw that early science of entrepreneurship. I thought entrepreneurship and startup mindset was all about Silicon Valley, but I noticed that this could happen anywhere in the world. And by providing a right infrastructure and support, a certain economy or community can change dramatically in such a short period of time. So it was like my aha moment where after I spent some time in China and Japan and came back to US to DCM headquarters, I said, you know what, this is, this is remarkable. I'm not just helping startups by writing a check, helping them become successful and rich and famous, but by do, creating this ecosystem, I am somewhat changing or impacting the, some community or even a country by bringing this entrepreneurship ecosystem into a different part of the world. So that led me to think, gosh, I, can I do this much better in my home country, Japan, which I just didn't, I didn't feel like I did enough at DCM and I wanted to do more focused effort such that I can make some impact in the society and and give back to the community. Part of your thesis of World Innovation Labs was also to have this understanding that innovation can not only come from small startups, but that we also have to embrace the fact that large corporations, they have a lot of money, they have a lot of good and talented people, they have a lot of resources to do R&D and to really bridge this gap between the small comic units of startups and the large corporates and finding this this right balance between large corporations and small innovative entities was part of forming your thesis around World Innovation Labs. Talk a little bit how you came up with this thesis and, and how you basically also morphed it into the LP structure of World Innovation Labs. And as I understand it, your LPs are not just passive capital allocators, but they actually take a, a rather active role in sourcing in diligencing, but also in actually creating some of the deal flow for the fund. Yeah. So after I felt like I learned my skills and the ecosystem of Silicon Valley, then I decided, okay, hey, what can I do for my country? I realized that the purely cut and paste of Silicon Valley model doesn't work simply because like you said, in Japan, a lot of the talents are still going to large corporations or government. 
And unless you can figure out how to convince them to leave and start a company or come up with a different structure to foster entrepreneurship, I cannot just say, hey, let's copy Silicon Valley and, and form a lot of VCs and assume talented people would start their own company. But like I said, the, the society is very different. Japan still, you know, this as a, a educational system plus how the society embraces how we behave is quite different. So if people are still st want to stay in a large organization, I have to figure out a way to run innovation in a different way. And after my observation, I realized, yes, one, to encourage truly talented people out of college to consider starting a company, just like Silicon Valley kids would do. That's one thing. But the other approach I thought I needed to do is kind of convert these employees in large corporations who have high potentials into entrepreneurs, meaning people in a large corporation who has entrepreneurial mindsets such that they can use their internal resource. You know, the big company obviously have a lot more money, a lot more technology, a lot more people. So leverage those resources around you to run some innovation inside the company. And I thought that this, this would fit Japanese culture, you know, obviously coming from Japan, growing up in the culture, people like to work with a team instead of doing everything yourself. So to have a team around you helps and to have a corporate support could potentially help run innovation much more efficiently. So that was my model when I thought about, okay, if I were to start my own company, how should I, how would I do it? So I said, let's make sure that one of the big supporters of my entity would become corporates. Corporate who wants to make a change is corporate that I can be the change agent such that by me helping, by, by me working with those corporates, I can at least facilitate entrepreneurship inside. And also that entity became also government. I said, okay, the corporates are one thing, but also the government has to change. Government has to embrace entrepreneurship where they are they set the policies and they set the regulations. If they don't understand the entrepreneurship, we cannot innovate. So quickly, I decided to partner with those two constituents in the society. So my fund, when I first formed the fund, instead of going after pension funds and fund of funds and endowments, just like traditional venture capital fund, I said, okay, I'll go after corporates. And I'm going to ask corporate not just to invest into my fund, but also send people to my office so that they can learn entrepreneurship firsthand while they search for deals, they run the due diligence with me together. And I'm going to try to transfer my knowledge to the corporates such that maybe one day they might just do their own corporate venturing themselves. But by doing corporate venturing together, I felt like we can, we can capture a wider industries. We can capture a wider trend. And by doing venturing together, obviously that working as a team, you can go further than working by yourself. So that was a concept I came up with. So when I formed World Innovation Lab, I talked to probably, you know, 20, 30 companies about my idea, forming like a consortium of a corporate venture capital fund. And my mission was not just investing and making money. My mission was also transferring my knowledge to their employees and also understanding their challenges such that I can search for technologies that can solve their issues. So it looks like a venture capital firm, but how I fundraise and how I operate is quite different because I am surrounded by 30 plus people in my office. They sometimes give me ideas about investment or they sometimes help me on due diligence or they sometimes help some of our portfolio company get into their corporates and they become a user. So it, it, it kind of very hands-on collaboration with the LPs. We're not just money and we, we're investor kind of relationship. We're acting like a family, so to speak. That's a super interesting model, I would say. And you're someone who has thought quite a lot about entrepreneurship and the Japanese culture and how the Japanese culture is not fostering entrepreneurship in many ways. And you have this slide on, you know, there's this seniority-based system. So basically, it's very hierarchical. People respect hierarchies. They respect senior partners at a firm. Then there's this consensus-based decision-making that is always part of, of every corporation and which obviously 
is the complete opposite from an entrepreneur who needs to have a strong opinion and just go for it. This is where sort of the, the Goldilocks zone of entrepreneurship lies. And last but not least, there's this big fear of failure, of losing the face in front of the family, in front of the friends. Talk about as someone who has really made it a mission for himself to foster innovation. Talk about how you think about entrepreneurship in Japan, how it's changing, how it, how it has evolved over the last couple of years in terms of the number of startups, but also government incentives. And obviously, as we're doing this entrepreneurship, it is a good gateway drug, in a sense, for people who are in this old culture, in this old hierarchical-based system to transition, to take risks, to, uh, to make sure that they are rewarded for taking risks and encouraged for taking risks, right? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think every society is going to change. But like I said, when I compare the pace of change in Silicon Valley or the rest of the world versus Japan, I felt the change was very slow and stagnant. And that's why I started my own firm. And to change the three areas that you mentioned, three issues, I would say that you mentioned, one is obviously seniority-based system, every decision-making, even at school or any organization was very consensus-driven. And obviously in, in the entire society had a fear of failure because how we were graded, even at school or even at corporate, were based on how well you behave, not about how much risk you take. So the more mistake you make, you're not getting into good school or you're not getting promoted. Therefore, the smarter you are, you are not going to try new things. So you are not going to take risks, which is completely opposite of what I was trying to do. So how do I make this change? One thing I had to do was to convince the government, who are the rule setters, that taking risks, trying new things, and learning from the failure is necessary in the world we live in. And I guess once you Talk about the reason people get it. When you're living in a world where things are very predictable, maybe Japanese way is very good. You respect certainty, you respect stability, and if everyone agrees with certain things, when you can predict what's going to happen in the future, I think consensus based in decision making works. And that's, I guess, how Japan became the number one in the world in 1980s after the World War II. But when the world was shifting towards where things are not predictable anymore, particularly after internet emerged. So in that paradigm, you cannot predict things. The only way to change yourself is to try. And you try and, and try a lot. And, and you have to learn from the failure and you keep moving. And that's the kind of the attitude you need. So I give a lot of examples how the world changed together with the, the change in the technology, how the world we live in has changed over time and the, the way we educate people, the way we train people, the, and the way we make decisions has to adapt to the change. So I think the government understood that they needed to make a change. That Prime Minister Abe, who was unfortunately assassinated, he was the first prime minister to come to Silicon Valley in 2015. I said, hey, entrepreneurship is very important for our country, which never happened in the past. So the first prime minister to admit that we have to change the way we do things, we have to embrace entrepreneurship, and I'm going to make sure that entrepreneurs would get rewarded socially and physically when they do the goodness to the society. So that kind of change from the government obviously trickled down to the corporate, to the individuals, and society has changed quite a bit. I mean, it's been only seven years since he came to Silicon Valley. But even in that seven years, if you look at Japan's venture capital market, it, it more than 10x. So you can see how venture capital activities get stimulated through the government push. And the society is now starting to embrace. In the past, when I grew up, if I said, I'm going to start a company, my entire relatives and my family would stop me to do it. But now some people would say, oh, that sounds cool. Maybe you become rich and famous and, and that's a cool thing. So I think society changed quite a bit. And all I'm trying to do is how can I accelerate this change such that younger people or people in the society who has good ideas can achieve their dreams or try something new by not being penalized from the society or by not being penalized by their boss. And that's what I'm trying to do. And I think I can see the world is changing much faster than I 
anticipate it. So that's all good. And I just have to keep doing it. And I have to keep rewarding entrepreneurs regardless of their failures or regardless they're successful. I just have to keep reminding, we have to keep trying and we have to embrace entrepreneurs and we have to have more role models in the society. Otherwise, no one's going to try new things and the society or the community is going to die. So that's kind of what I'm seeing in what's happening right now and what that's what I think I have to keep doing. Makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, when I think about entrepreneurship as an acceptable career path, it's not just Japan that's sort of struggling with it. We had it in the U.S. as well. I think nowadays it's quite acceptable to go to a top tier university and then apply for Y Combinator afterwards. And so we have this career as an entrepreneur and talking about sort of acceleration of entrepreneurship. And you have this great slide where you outline different solutions that corporates have tried in the past. So for example, for this seniority based system, there's this Maija strategy. This basically means that you're setting up small teams within the organization that have different spaces where you can, outside of the large corporation, from innovative teams, come up with new solutions. Then there's sort of the diversity hiring model to, to help with the consensus-based decision-making. Basically, you bring out outside entrepreneurs into the organization. And then last but not least, it's there's the model that you're fostering with the open innovation, right? Which is that you, that you combine venture capital with entrepreneurship, with incubation, and, and it's probably the most complex, but it's also the one that is probably the most promising long-term, right? Yes. Like you said, to address the three imminent issues that we mentioned, to challenge a seniority-based system, the first thing I did, like, okay, if you're staying at headquarters, your boss is always looking at you. Therefore, you cannot try new things or you're not allowed to skip the order. So that, that doesn't help. That means that if you're young, you, just by, by being young, simply you cannot try new things. And that really doesn't help entrepreneurship. So the first thing I did is that, can I create remote location where people, if you want to try new things, you move to this remote location where your rank, where you came from, doesn't matter. All you do in this kind of isolated area, which we call it Dejima, is it's like an extraterritorial area that we are exempt from being penalized. And that you are supposed to try new things. You can make mistakes. As long as you're learning from mistakes, you're fine. So I basically created this nice little office in Palo Alto where people from Japan can come to my office and experiment new things, which in headquarters, they may not be able to do so because they're just too young or the rank is not high enough. So that was one thing to kind of overcome the seniority based system, which we saw a lot of good results from it. And obviously consensus driven happens when people have the same education, people have a same type of social background. And to change that, you really have to increase diversity. So for me, even my team, when I hire my team, I had to hire people who used to be an entrepreneur, people from overseas, not just people from Japan. I always try to find people, foreigners who grew up in Japan or who love Japanese culture or whatnot, because that's the only way I can make myself diverse and well-prepared. And also by having a diverse team myself, I can also influence my LP base that diversity is a good thing. And by having diverse organization, the areas you can expand can just change dramatically than having a very homogeneous culture. So that was another thing. And then finally, fear of failure. This is not just a pound thing. Every, everyone, including people in Silicon Valley, people from anywhere, of course, everyone is scared of being failure. You don't want to humiliate yourself and you always want to be successful. You always want to look good, but it's just about, is there a mechanism to mitigate those embarrassment or, or being criticized by other people. And the only way to overcome the fear of failure is to just be open to the startup community. If you are a large corporation, go get close to the startup world and you will realize that more than half of the startup fail, but yet they learn valuable lessons and that's why they can keep moving forward. And I think those mentality needs to be transferred into large organization because the first thing when I talk about venturing with these big companies, like, 
again, okay, get what you're saying, but make sure that when we do project, let's say we do 10 projects, all 10 have to be successful. And I said, no, 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 one will be successful. Then you have to give up nine because if you don't have a courage to shut down non-performing new businesses, you're not learning anything. You're just procrastinating the failure. And that means you're not learning anything. And if you want to do something entrepreneurial, you have to have a guts to close more than half of what you did and keep investing in the things that you think is going, doing well. And that's a very different mindset from traditional way of thinking because people don't want to fail. People just don't want to shut down a new business mm -hmm. when, once you start it. But those were the things that we do at Will when we work in the startup, which is quite important because once if society can embrace these three way of three way of different mindset, I think the country would change and mm -hmm. it would open up a huge market for startup investment. And talking about guts and taking entrepreneurial risks, let's talk about your entrepreneurial journey. The day is 2014. You're a partner at DCM and you decide you're going to spin out. You're going to start something fresh, something new, something unproven at that time. And you're raising your first fund, World Innovation Labs Fund One. It was a 350 million fund, very successful for a first time fund. You had LPs, including Sony, Mizubang. So quite a accomplishment. And I assume it looks it looks like an overnight success, but it probably took you a while to get the buy-in from all those stakeholders. These are large organizations, very hierarchical themselves, and probably not used to doing venture investments. How was sort of this fundraising process for you for this first fund? Yes. So when I left DCM to pursue my, my interests, where it was not just about investing in startup, but also educating people who invest in a fund, which are LPs, and also hopefully helping those big companies start little startup projects internally, I needed a different vehicle. So uh, I started my own company, World Innovation Lab, and I named it Lab because I didn't think I'm doing a venture fund, but it, it's almost like a lab where you are trying new things and where you, you are learning from the startups. So, and that's why I named it Lab. And... When I pitched the idea to various corporations, because obviously, like I said, I had to make sure that the corporates are my LPs such that I'm not just investing. I'm not doing this as a purely financial business. It, I, I wanted to transfer my knowledge. I wanted to change the organization who became our LPs. So I had to go after these corporates. And obviously, the toughest thing was the fact that it was so unique. People would ask me, Again, so is this a venture capital fund you're trying to do? Or is it a consulting firm that you're trying to teach us how to start a business? Or is it, are you starting a little MBA program for corporate? So since there was nothing that it was close to what I was doing, every time they get fascinated. But then the next question is that, so do you have anything in analogy? And when I say, no, I think this is pretty new. I'm putting together probably venture capital and kind of strategic consulting and a little bit of mini MBA, people are like, oh, again, you can't do three things. You're a startup. You have to focus on one. And that was kind of where I got stuck because I didn't want to become a purely the financial venture capital fund. I didn't want to run a consulting firm. I didn't want to just run the school. I wanted to do all three because there was all interconnected in my mind. And I said, this is new and this is going to help your company become very entrepreneurial. So that storytelling took quite a bit of time. So the fundraising was not very linear. It was very binary. So everyone said, oh, that's interesting. But no one wanted to write a check. So I was always zero for a very long time. So at one point I said, you know what? You know, this fund fundraising is not going to happen. Maybe I'll end up doing some consulting work for them. But the very first company who said I'm in was an airline company called ANA which is interesting because airline company, you know, it's an airline company. They fly passengers and stuff. And I thought, why do you care about innovation? Why do you care about entrepreneurship? But it was interesting when you have one big company in Japan who says, I love your idea. I want to become more than just an airline company. We can offer more experience to the consumers and I have to try something new. I think a lot of big companies who are just kind of observing what happens to my new venture 
said, you know, if, if this company is coming in, there must be something. I'm going to come in. I'm going to help you. And I'm going to help you. And all of a sudden, my fund, I was kind of thinking, okay, if I get like $100 million fund, that's a good start or first fund. But surprise, surprise, I got up to $360 million. And i like, oh my gosh, this is working. And I never thought that my fund would be so big. But this also reassures that my, at least my thesis, something is right. People resonated. And all the CEOs who wrote a check to me were looking for changes. You know, even asking for a small company like myself, it was just me and a PowerPoint. And they wanted some kind of catalyst to change themselves. And they're all big companies. Like you said, you have Sony and all these big company names in, on our website. They, they all came to me and said, hey, again, we'd love to try this. I would love to change our corporate culture and see how we can change. So in retrospect, very risky fundraising because I had nothing to lose. I was myself and I wanted to try my thesis, but right. Mm -hmm. And like I said, in the beginning, everyone says it's interesting, 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 but no commitment, no commitment, no commitment. And just by having one airline company committing, all of a sudden, everyone said, we'll come in. And that's how that's that so funny. Yeah. It's uh, oftentimes with uh, fundraising, it's non-linear and you need one strong an anchor or a couple of anchors and then everybody wants in. So it's quite hard in the be beginning and then also quite hard in the end when you get oversubscribed and have to have to limit the allocation of certain LPs. Yeah. But uh, definitely a big success from your side. And I mean, I love it that you also thought about, you know, even pivoting World Innovation Labs into sort of an advisory shop in the beginning if fundraising had not been successful. And in fact, I mean, if I look at what you're doing at World Innovation Labs, it is slightly unusual. It's not your typical venture fund. You do education, as you said, you do value creation, business creation, you work with those LPs. And then sort of as a last thing, you also do investments, right? Yeah. Talk about sort of the whole spectrum of things that you do and where you personally spend the most of your time. Yeah. So I should explain how those three activities connect to each other, because otherwise it lo still looks like I'm doing something so different. And I'm kind of all over the place. So since my corporates and the government are the sponsor of my fund, I am in a position to listen to their CEOs, what they care about and what are the issues they want to solve, let's say in the next three years or next five years. So I'm in a perfect position to understand what are the obstacles or what are the challenges that they're facing. So that becomes my investment thesis. And initially, everyone's saying, oh, our organization, just it's just so slow. It's very hierarchical. And I, I know that in, in Western world, everyone uses this cloud software to make decisions faster and so-called digital transformation. So that was my mission. And, and I went into a lot of B2B software companies that basically streamlines a lot of the decision-making process to a lot of tools to make their day-to-day -day activities much faster and more efficient. And of course, when I signed these startups, they love it because they become a user. And the startup founder also loves us because they're like, again, you're not only writing a check to us, you are introducing these lighthouse customers in Japan. And as you know, once you get a big name customer in Japan, all other fall. So it became so much easier for these startups to enter Japanese market by just having some of our LPs and actively engaging with some of our portfolio companies. So our investment became kind of a demand driven instead of, you know, at DCM, all of us would get together in the room and say, okay, what is our investment thesis? You know, what should we invest? It was all driven by partners in the room. Whereas here at Will, I have all the ideas coming from the LPs, coming from the government, such that I kind of know what I need to look for. And the hit ratio of my thesis is much higher, obviously, because there's, I already see the early demands of what I'm looking for. So that's one. And obviously by kind of matching and by introducing these startups to these big companies, the next step big company would say is like, hey, again, you know, this company is very interesting, but we also do a similar thing or we feel like we should be doing something in the same sector. Can we do it ourselves? So that's where our incubation team, our business creation team would go in and say, oh, what are the technology you have internally? And if they say, Oh, we have these technology, but because it's part of a large corporation, it, it doesn't shine or the people who are running these little business units never get attention. 
that's when I, my entrepreneurship light bulb goes up and say, okay, let's spin out that entity. And by giving a spotlight to this small team who is doing something very valuable in the world we live in today, maybe they might have a better chance to grow faster as an independent entity. So that's our business creation job. We spin out entity or some technology out of our LP partners. We hire entrepreneurs, people who run the company, and some of the companies get bought back by the parent company, but some company do get exit through IPO or, so, or some other by being acquired by other company. So that's another way to kind of implement entrepreneurship, not just investing into startup, but launching a business or spinning out a business yourself. And finally, if I want to see more entrepreneurship in the society, I kind of have to keep educating why this is interesting. If you're confident, if you have ideas, why you should be doing it. So that's kind of our kind of education empowerment activities become critical because the more we empower people in the larger organization or people in the government or even people in, in other parts of the society, if they become entrepreneurs, they remember us and they might become the next Google. And we want to just empower everyone in the society and give a chance for everyone to lead the next generation. So all three activities kind of are intertwined. Uh, investing in startup is one thing, but helping big, big corporates spin out and run their own business, just like a startup is another thing. And also teaching people entrepreneurship such that they can start, they can think about starting a company is another thing. And all three activities come together. And if we can you know, invest in some of the companies and help them grow, you know, that's even better because that's how we, you know, make money as business. I love it how you have success stories in all three areas already. So I want to start maybe on the investment side. I think you invested in 15 unicorns so far. Yes. Companies like Asana and Wise, Auth0. If I look at the website, it mentions it's sort of the sweet spot. What you're looking for is mid to late stage venture. Yes. So more on the early growth side in the US yes. and Europe, then also doing some occasional sort of seed in investment for funds. So basically primaries in, in smaller seed funds, as well as corporate venture. Talk a little bit about sort of the investment strategy. You mentioned that you use this ability to introduce lighthouse customers to get into those competitive deals. I mean, these rounds have become extremely competitive in the last two years. Yeah. And I think you introduced, for example, Asana to ANA, one of your LPs. Then you introduced Intertrust to Line and yeah. Auth0 and to Docomo. So you have all these examples um, where you did, did exactly bring value to the startups and then it becomes beneficial. For the venture investment unit, like you said, we have three activities. You know, one is direct investment into startups. A lot of them are series B, C, Ds, simply because, like I said, I want to sell, I want to solve real issues that corporate already have. And to do that, I need to have a proven technology or at least technology that is already working. Therefore, mid to later stage, having our core investment in the past. And another thing is, like you said, you, you're right. I mean, the venture market is so competitive particularly this past two years because of those non-traditional investors who were coming in, it was awfully difficult for us to go into these good deals because they were pricing a lot higher than we do. They're writing a bigger check and we're sitting here and saying, hey, we know that this company is really good, but we can't invest because these corporate ventures or big hedge funds are investing and we just don't have an allocation. So we really have to think hard. How do we get how do we win deals? And eventually we said we were so razor focused around these big companies and also government. So if we become investor, we're going to help you enter Japanese market. It is one of the hardest market because the language is different. Business culture is different. However, we have a team in Tokyo who would help you how to hire country manager to how to do sales to the government, how to do sales to our big company LPs and make sure that these lighthouse customers will help you expand the business space in Japan much faster than anyone else. So we had to prove it. And obviously, like you said, Asana, or Zero, Automation Anywhere, some of the big U.S. enterprise company. We did a lot of effort locally in Japan, make sure that the sales in Japan is growing very fast, such that we look like a very credible investor. 
to build a reputation in Silicon Valley. So our team has been doing that. That was one way we invest and we win very competitive deals. Another investment we do is, yes, we do have a fund of fund investment unit. It's a separate fund and, and we invest in other VC funds or European funds or Asian funds to have alliance. And the reason why I do this is that because our team is still very small, we want to make sure that we understand what's happening in some other regions, also certain domains that we're not good at. Like I said, my team right now focus on B2B software, but I want to understand what's happening in the space, what's happening in healthcare, what's happening in even the consumer space. It's either me building myself or working with some other VCs who are very strong in those areas. So I decided to go down the latter path. So we became LP to some of the funds who are very good at clean tech, we're very good at consumer tech, we're very good at some other technology or regions such that they can help us source some of the deals. And a lot of them are early stage focus funds so that we don't overlap, we don't have to compete. So we get a lot of introductions on the investment they made at seed or series A so that we can consider, you know, leading the series B or C. And, and that has been very a fruitful partnership with a lot of the U.S.-based fund. And thirdly, we also have helped some of our LPs run their own corporate venture capital fund. And this is very specific to specific certain thesis because our LP come from a different background. It could be automotive company, it could be insurance company, it could be bank, it could be telecom company. And, and each company have their own focus. So we provide some of the back office support such that they don't have to do everything from scratch. But by assisting these corporate venture activities, we also get to understand particular industry very deep because they typically would have their own employees go after a particular domain very deep. And we assist them by doing that. We, we get a lot of knowledge about particular industry much deeper than the will members traditionally would do. So by combining this venture capital middle later stage activity with a primary focus on Japan entry strategy and helping fund of funds. Also, again, a lot of them come to us with a portfolio and asking, hey, can you help my company X enter Japanese market? Because I know that Japan is a huge market for enterprise or even consumer. And, and lastly, corporate venture, we have a lot of company LP from various industries. And obviously ourselves, we want to have a deeper domain expertise while LPs achieve their own objective. So by combining all three investment activities, you, again, we are very unique as a venture capital fund because not many funds do all three. And you know, typically funds are focused on either of those three, but we, we kind of do all of them under the same umbrella. And we're trying to create a lot of synergy among these three activities. And a couple of weeks ago, you announced, as I mentioned at the top of the show, the successful close of World Innovation Labs 3 as well as the Strategic Partners Fund and the Corporate Venture Fund. You raised more than a billion dollars in total across yes. these three vehicles. Talk about sort of what's next. Is that continuation of the existing strategy? Are there certain niches that you're going after with this newly announced fund? What's sort of your outlook, the future of World Innovation Labs? Yeah, I think I'm lucky to have fundraised in a perfect timing, to be honest. You know, it would be awfully difficult if we had to fundraise this today since the market changed quite a bit. So we were fundraising when the market was heating up and we closed the fund when market collapsed. So for me, you feel like, oh, this is a perfect time to invest because the market is adjusting and we don't have to go into this evaluation fight anymore. And we can sit down with the entrepreneurs and come up with a decent valuation that I feel comfortable. So it's great for us. This is the best time for us to invest. Now, I think the world changed quite a bit too. 2020, we saw COVID crisis and even our lifestyle changes, remote working, spending a lot of time in digital shopping, digital entertainment. You know, it could be Netflix or it could be whatever you call metaverse and our behavior changed and new industry emerged. And in 2022, the war started. And we're now talking about national security. It could be food, it could be energy, and, and it could be cybersecurity. So we are seeing new issues or demand in the market this past few years. So I feel like there are so many things which are not solved yet. And a lot of our corporate partners are more and more keen on, you know, obviously in the past when it started, well, it was about digital transformation. How do they digitize their management? How do they do business on digital world? 
But now they're all talking about how do they contribute reducing the carbon? Because a lot of my partners are manufacturing business. And we all know that CO2 reduction is a huge trend in the U.S. And, and obviously all over the world and new technology are emerging. Obviously it's not proven yet, but someone's going to win big. So we kind of have to look into these new, new themes that we were not paying attention enough. So I feel like we have a lot of new topics, not just clean tech, not just digital transformation, but we have to think about our healthcare system. We also have to think about our security and the world continues to create a lot of issues that we have to solve. So I think our mission from now on is to identify these new issues that is evolving and find which area to participate and hopefully help these startup grow and solve these issues. I love it how you frame it, that the world keeps coming up with new issues so that venture capitalists keep having a job and finding the new solution. That's right. Right. Jen, as we're running against the clock here, yep. where can people find out more about you? That's your time for the call to action. Where can they and find out what World Innovation Labs is up to. Are there any events? Is there anyone they can reach out to? How can they follow you? That's your time for the call to action here. Yes, we do share a lot of our insights in, in our website, wilab.com, wilab.com. And we also have a Twitter account, wilab.com, uh, wilab.com on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook. So if you can search, we'll, I'm sure our, our website will show up and we would try to continue to send our message. You know, I was a little hesitant to promote my firm too much before I feel like I did something. And this, this is my eighth year with my firm. We raised three funds and the main fund and, and various other funds. And we feel like we have enough case studies internally to share with the world and share with a particular with the corporate world who continues to have challenges in running innovation. So I look forward to sharing more learnings from my past journey and hosting events. You know, we recently opened our second office in Palo Alto. So we're trying to have more local events with some of our peer groups. Now that the world seems to be opening up and we can ha now have face-to-face -face meetings. So yes, I'll try to you know, get more messages out and welcome any feedbacks on the website or, or Twitter or LinkedIn feeds so that we can do better. Yeah, I'm looking forward to coming to one of these events in Palo Alto at one point yeah. in time. And it sounds great. And I'm, I'm quite excited about the whole mission and what you've accomplished in those eight years only. So thanks a lot for being here with us today and best of luck. We will, we will follow your journey. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.